Powerful storms and high tides in Northern California today could slow efforts to fill a large sinkhole. Crews have been working to fill the 15 foot hole along the coast. It first appeared on Saturday. John Blackstone is in Pacifica, about 10 miles south of San Francisco, with the ongoing problem with erosion. John, good morning. Good morning. Well, here in Pacifica, we're right on the western edge of the continent. This apartment building is empty and condemned because it could slide into the Pacific Ocean because of cliff erosion. And over here now, a popular hiking path down to the beach is closed because part of it has disappeared into a huge sinkhole. A 15-foot section of the trail just dropped away into the ocean. The trail is now off limits as crews pump concrete and sand into the massive sinkhole. This is only the latest effort to stop erosion of the cliff here that has been falling away for decades. We've seen waves up pretty high and the king tides are bad every year, but this is the worst I've seen. The company that owns the land told CBS this morning an underground pipe separated, causing leaking water to saturate the ground below. As crews work to stabilize the area, powerful tides are moving in. Sand just, you know, uh, washed away, and that's why we had big cavity. The cliffs here are more than 100 feet tall, and when the base is pounded by high surf, the bluff is undermined. When you get the big breakers and swells, ground swells coming in, that really takes a beating on these things. Rick Giliaza grew up in this area. He's watched waves erode the Pacifica coastline for years. I have memories of when I was a child out here, and uh, I take my wife out here now and try and find the places where my dad and I fished years ago. They're gone. Houses that were once here are gone too. When major El Nino storms hit California in 1998, the bluffs eroded so quickly residents fled before one home tumbled into the ocean. Other houses were knocked down before they too fell off the cliff. Earlier this year, two apartment buildings were demolished as the bluff beneath them continued to drop away. And a third Ocean View apartment complex was condemned as massive erosion put the building at cliff's edge. You must have come along here, seen those apartments often. Could you ever have imagined that it would be like it is today, hanging off the edge? Well, Gosh, coming out here every storm? Yeah, I do. I mean, there's just nothing stopping this water. Now, once the sun rises, the view from here is spectacular, which is why there are apartment buildings all along this bluff. The nearest apartment building to here was recently renamed Ocean Air, and that's perhaps because its previous name conjured up a now too precarious image. It used to be called Land's End. Mm. Nora? Mm, how about that, John? Thank you so much. A Christian governor in the world's largest Muslim nation is on trial for blasphemy charges. His case is being seen as a test of Indonesia's commitment to religious tolerance. While Christians defend Basuki Pranama's comments about the misinterpretation of the Quran, some Muslims are outraged. Meng Faili has the story. On Tuesday, Jakarta Governor Basuki Pernama, also known as Ahok, was brought to the state court for the first day of his trial. He is accused of committing blasphemy against Islam because of statements he made several months ago. If he's found guilty, the Christian governor could face up to five years in prison. Ahok is the first ethnic Chinese governor of Jakarta and the first non-Muslim to serve in the office for more than half a century. He's running for re-election next year. Ahok suggested politicians misinterpret the Quran when they state that Muslims should not be governed by non-Muslims. The state prosecutor told the court that Ahok insulted Islam and desecrated the Quran by using one of its verses to mislead voters in order to increase his chances of winning. His trials was filled with a heavy police presence and disruptive traffic restrictions were in place around the courthouse. Hundreds of protesters rallied outside the court to demand that Ahok be jailed. Despite the chaos, Ahok insisted he never intended to offend any religious individual or groups when he made the comments last September. I never intended to insult Muslims or insult the clergy. On that basis, I plead with the judges to consider my exception plea. 
Ahok's supporters also show up outside the courthouse to defend the Christian leader's innocence. They believe radical Muslims in Jakarta are trying to harm Ahok's re-election chances. He never wants to insult any other religion. He wouldn't tolerate any action against his country and his people. Some fear Ahok's trial signals a rapid growing Islam militancy in the country of 250 million. Christian represents less than 10% of the Indonesian's population. According to the Indonesia's constitution, freedom of religion is well protected nationwide. However, militant Muslim groups often take violent and legal action against the Christians and churches. Ahok's lawyer asked the five judge panel to throw the case out. The judges adjourned the trial until December 20th. Meng Fei Li, CBN. Yahoo says more than a billion users were affected by a hack that occurred back in August of 2013. Yahoo said Wednesday the theft is likely separate from another cyber attack disclosed in September of 2016 that occurred in late 2014 and affected 500 million users. The company said it's taken steps to secure user accounts and is working closely with law enforcement. Data breaches are on the rise in the U.S., affecting companies like Target and Anthem. Through September 20th of this year, 687 reported breaches exposed roughly 28.8 million records, according to the nonprofit Identity Theft Resource Center. Other companies hit recently by large security breaches include extramarital dating site Ashley Madison, which was hacked in July of 2015, exposing the personal information of nearly 40,000 account holders across the world. In February of 2015, hackers penetrated a health insurance database at Anthem, exposing personal information like birthdays and social security numbers of about 80 million people. In August of 2014, J.P. Morgan Chase said about 76 million households were affected by a cybersecurity attack that exposed names, email addresses, phone numbers, and mailing addresses of customers who accessed Chase.com via the internet or a mobile device. And in May of that same year, eBay asked the 145 million registered users of its namesake marketplace to change their passwords following a cyber attack that compromised encrypted passwords and other non-financial data. One month earlier, in April of 2014, Home Depot fell victim to a hacker that stole a vendor's password. That one password led to the exposure of 56 million credit card accounts, as well as 53 million customer email addresses. And finally, during the 2013 holiday shopping season, Target hackers got access to up to 70 million people's information. The leaked data included customer debit and credit card information, as well as customer names, addresses, and phone numbers. Next tonight, first there was Flint, now another American city in the news, and this question, what is in the water? In Corpus Christi, Texas, they now fear a chemical spill has contaminated the water, and here's ABC's Kena Whitworth. Frustration tonight in Corpus Christi, Texas. Schools closed, lines wrapping around buildings, people waiting for hours just to buy this water. I can't boil the water, that's how bad it is. I think it's ridiculous. Authorities warning the more than 300,000 people not to bathe or drink their tap water after a chemical used in asphalt may have contaminated the city's water supply. The city is requesting state assistance. Protesters interrupting city officials. Since July of 2015, the city has had three boil water notices following other incidents of contamination. And Corpus Christi, not alone, problems with keeping the nation's drinking water supply clean was highlighted in Flint, Michigan, where a state of emergency was declared after residents didn't have clean drinking water for years. David, they're shipping in 100,000 cases of water and each family only allowed two cases. In the meantime, testing continues on the city's water supply. Desperate. Evacuation is underway right now in the Syrian city of Aleppo. Video appears to show a convoy of ambulances bringing injured people from the tiny area still held by rebels. Syrian government buses are ready to remove thousands of trapped civilians. Holly Williams is following the story from Istanbul. Holly, good morning. Good morning. We've obtained a video that appears to show an attack on a convoy of civilians and injured people by pro-Syrian regime forces, reportedly wounding at least three. The ambulances and cars were trying to ferry people out of Aleppo and to safety. 
Instead, they came under fire. This man was apparently shot while travelling in an ambulance. This comes a day after yet another ceasefire fell apart and an evacuation of fighters and civilians was cancelled. An offensive by the Syrian regime, backed by Russia and Iran, has left the rebels with only a tiny pocket of territory in Aleppo, around two square miles, where several thousand civilians are thought to be trapped. After four years of fighting, the Syrian government is in control of the rest of the city. It's a victory for the regime and its allies, Russia and Iran, but it's come at a horrendous human cost. Regime forces have indiscriminately bombed civilians. There are also unconfirmed reports of more than 80 civilians being executed in Aleppo by pro-regime forces. Nora. Mm. Awful situation there, Holly. Thank you a so much. A strong rebuke by the White House against Russia for what it's calling a contradiction in strategy. A focus on propping up the Syrian government that the U.S. says has allowed ISIL to retake Palmyra and seize an anti-aircraft missile system. The ISIL threat today, again, if these reports are true, is worse because of the failed strategy of the Syrians and the Russians. The White House has repeatedly defended its efforts to resolve the Syrian conflict diplomatically. Still, it's under increasing pressure to do more, to stop the carnage in Aleppo. We told people that help was on the way, that we were going to be providing arms to their brothers and sons and fathers, and, you know, we just never delivered in the way that we said we would. We left them hanging. Increasingly, there's a push inside the United States to call what's happening in Aleppo a war crime. There are questions, too, about whether the reports of men, women and children being slaughtered in the streets have heightened to the levels of genocide committed in Bosnia and Rwanda, where some have accused then-President Bill Clinton of failing to act. It should shame you. The White House says President Obama and Secretary of State John Kerry have led a tireless effort to bring the violence to an end. Still, there are many who believe that a diplomatic end to the chaos is unlikely, and Syrian government forces will continue to capture previously held rebel territory. Aleppo is not the last victory that we're going to see with Bashar al-Assad, but perhaps one of the first. And unless there is a significant introduction of new military forces or military power into the fight, I, I see in, in the medium and long term this effort has failed on the part of the rebels. Well, the U.S. has encouraged other countries to support its efforts diplomatically. Its military efforts remain contained, with just a little more than a few hundred special operations troops advising and training Syrian rebels. And there is little political will at the moment for more. Kimberly Helkett, Al Jazeera, Washington.